All right, amen. Good morning, church. I know it's last Sunday of the year. We're gonna go all out, amen. This is the call to the triumphant, to the victorious people of God, and we know that we are always fighting in the position of victory, amen, church. So this is prepare our section. Start to sway, start to clap your hands, and let's start singing. We praise you, Jesus. You deserve our praise. Hey.
our desire to bring glory to your name because you are the source of our joy thank you for your grace thank you for your faithfulness that has sustained us all throughout the year and now we declare
worship to you. You deserve it, and we say amen to this worship, amen to this year. Come on, church. Hey, Gateway, Merry Christmas, and welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here with us today, and we pray that you've had a wonderful weekend celebrating Christmas. And good on you for being here this morning at church to round out your Christmas weekend. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Please be reminded that this week is one of our weeks of our Christmas and New Year break for our volunteers and staff. So there is no regular programming or connect groups happening at the church this week at all. So make sure you don't show up for any of those this week. Also, something that you can mark on your calendar is that next Sunday, January 2nd, there will once again be only one Sunday morning service happening at 9.30. So if you usually attend the 11.30, we suggest coming on out to the 9.30 as there will be no 11.30 on January 2nd. But if you can't make the 9.30, don't worry because there will be online church happening at 6.30 p.m. Thank you, Gateway, for giving generously into God's house. You know, this is the last week of December and our very last week to be able to give into God's house for the year of 2021. So we want to encourage you to give strongly and give big because His local church is worth it. So there's three ways that you can continue to give into God's house today. And the first is by giving in person. Simply drop your giving in one of the giving boxes. The second is by giving online. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give and follow the prompts. And the third way is by text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's appearing on the screen right now. Thank you, Gateway, for all of your faithful giving over the year 2021. We're so thankful for each and every one of you and your commitment to partner with us as we point people to Jesus and celebrate changed lives. Now that's all I got for you this morning. So have a great rest of your Christmas week. We'll see you back right here next Sunday. And Pastor Brian, over to you. Well, good morning, Gateway. So good to see you out on a cold Saskatchewan morning, but here we are. Let's finish strong. Final Sunday of the year. We're just so happy that you were able to make it. And hey, one service today. What's with that? I feel like uh, I'm working a part-time job here. <laughs> but it's just so good to, to be together. I hope that you have really enjoyed your Christmas season so far. It's not over yet, but yesterday, no doubt, visiting with family and friends, and uh, may those just be some sweet get-togethers and, uh, and in the days ahead. And, and so let's just really believe the Lord for all of the, the specialness that we can squeeze out of, out of this amazing season that we call Christmas. Some of you are wearing some of your Christmas gifts that you received, aren't you? I just know that you are. One family was doing the Christmas gift opening thing on Christmas morning, and, and there was one young boy in the family that clearly was upset with the ratio of toys to clothes in his pile of Christmas gifts. And, and then a little bit later on, his mother noticed him going up the stairs, and she said, Bernie, where are you going? He said, I'm going up to my bedroom to play with my new socks. Uh, just turn to somebody and say, some people's kids. <laughs> Come on, for the final time in 2021, would you boldly repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow His example. Say, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. All right, if you can say amen to that, then we're ready to get into the Word this morning. And, and again, I, I want to just say one more time, uh, this is the final time I'll be able to say that this year, but welcome to those who are joining us online. Really great to have you with us as well on this final Sunday of, of 2021. So our teaching series on the theme of commitment is suspended for these two weeks, Christmas weekend, and again next week, uh, and for, for New Year's weekend. But then on January 8th, we will pick up with that uh, series on commitment. We have a couple of more 
segments in that series. We're going to finish it out. And, and then toward the beginning of February, we are going to introduce to you a, a brand new theme that we feel is, is really important for us as a church as we move in to the new year. And, and that's going to be the theme of uh, helping others. And, and so, but today, this is the day that we call Boxing Day, typically a really crazy, busy uh, uh, shopping day at the, the malls, you know, with Boxing Day sales and exchanges and lineups. Don't you just love those lineups? I don't know about you, but I'd rather be in church than at the mall on Boxing Day. Do I get any amens on that? I just commend you guys. Good for you for being here at church this morning. I'm pretty sure that there are some stores that don't do refunds or exchanges on Boxing Day because it kind of slows them down from their process of, of all the, uh, the on-sale items, right? ka <laughs> Have you ever heard the name John Wanamaker? John Wanamaker. Just check the files of your brain. Does that ring a bell at all? John Wanamaker. He was a man who founded what became a, a department store chain across the U.S. He began in, in the city of Philadelphia. This is back in the late 1800s. John came up with a really novel idea known as the refund policy. Yeah, he was the one who initially uh, had that that brilliant idea to, to give people their money back if they weren't entirely satisfied with what they purchased. You know, a good way to remember the name Wanamaker. Wanamaker happy? Then just give her the assurance that if she's, if she's not happy with what she purchased, that she can go back to the store and get a full refund. That's a good way to remember the name, John Wanamaker. Wanamaker happy? Are you living in the same home with someone who is an expert shopper? Wanamaker happy? Direct her to those stores where they have a great refund policy. So the idea caught on. Obviously, the refund policy has become very, very popular in the entire retail arena, right? Why is that? It's because the refund policy conveys the idea that they're more interested in helping people than they are in their bottom line profits. That sounds like a pretty good concept, doesn't it? Folks, why does that idea of the, the refund policy, why does it have a familiar ring to it? Is it because we love to shop at at Walmart, where they have a, you know, a very no questions asked return policy? Or is it because it's a biblical policy? Bingo. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's why that idea sounds familiar to us. It's in the Bible, the whole idea of putting others first, right? Come on, everybody say, put others first. Does that ring true? Does that, does that resonate deep down inside of you? Or are you saying, are you kidding? Why would we do that? <laughs> Come on, this should rub you the right way. Put others first. This is solidly a biblical concept. Let's read this morning from the, the book of Philippians. Chapter 2, and I begin in verse 3. Let's try this on for size. Here's what the, the Word of God says through the writings of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the believers in the church at the city of Philippi. Do nothing out of selfish, selfish. Far be it from you and I to live selfishly, right? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility... Value others. Everybody say others. Let's call this message this morning others. Value others above yourselves. How about that? Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset 
as Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on here and and he talks about how Jesus is the perfect example of, of looking to the interests and to the needs of others, that being you and I. Let's read it. He says, have the same mind, the same heart, the same attitude in yourself that you see in Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and and being found in appearance as a man. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Yeah, as a sacrificial lamb so that he could pave the way for you and I to be saved and sanctified. So Jesus humbled himself and became a human, a person. And not only did he become human, wow, he took it a step further and he went to the cross for us. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Somebody say amen. Oh, clearly, this is the word of God. Let this same mind be in you that was in Jesus himself. Folks, the mind of Christ is to be genuinely interested in helping others. Can I say that again? The mind of the Lord is to be genuinely caring about the needs of other people around us, not just caring about ourselves. See, the whole point of Christmas is that Jesus cared enough about you and I that he forfeited the comforts of heaven so that he could come and get the job of redemption done by laying his life down and taking it up again in the resurrection. Wow. Notice how this paid off for Jesus as as God rewarded him by, by exalting him to the place of lordship. You see, It was Jesus' way of thinking. It was his divine nature. It was his personal policy to look to the interests of others. Everybody say policy. It was Jesus' personal policy. How do you feel about policy? Are you okay with policy? You understand, the word policy and the word police, they both come from the same root. Policy. Yeah, you ever, you, you ever find that policies rubbed you the wrong way? <laughs> you ever find that policies sometimes can be really downright annoying? But policies can also be a wonderful thing. Aren't you glad for some of the policies that have been set in place that kind of keep things running smoothly? Policies are good, aren't they? All right, not always, but most policies have some real value for us. I'll tell you what, this personal policy of Jesus that can get in you and I and can get on you and I and that can rub off of you and I onto others, this personal policy is a beautiful one. Let me tell you about policy. Uh, One day there was a college professor who outlined some policy for the students in his class because it was this time of year and the students wanted to do something nice. And so they got together and they all chipped in and they bought a Christmas gift for this college professor. They knew that he liked smoking cigars in his personal time. And so they bought him a box of expensive cigars, wrapped it up, put it on his desk. He came in, found the gift, opened the gift, and then he stood in front of the class and he said, he said, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that this university has a policy that they're very strict about. As professors, we are not allowed to receive gifts from our students. So I have no alternative but to take this gift that you have given me. I'm going to take it home and burn it. One cigar at a time. <laughs> The college has a policy. (laughs) 
Jesus has a policy. I love it. Considering the interests of others. He could have just stayed in heaven. I mean, that's comfortable, right? But he so got outside of his comfort zone, he became an earthling like you and I, and then he stooped to the cross. There was no other way that he could rescue you and I from the garbage dump of of sin, the slave market of sin. Wow, he came to set us free. He came to lay a blessing on us. Aren't you so grateful for the Christmas gift that Father God has given us in the person of Jesus Christ? That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible, his unspeakable gift. Yeah, the incomparable Jesus Christ. What a Christmas gift has been given to us. Jesus is the one whose personal policy is to be really interested in addressing the needs of others. Not just worried about his, his own comfort. And of course, Jesus, he wants to, to train you and I to live the same way. Wouldn't that be something to, you know, to to carve a path through life with this personal policy, to be on the lookout for for people, and if we recognize needs, that we're so ready to to reach out and and to care and to help and to bless and, and to minister to the needs of people around us instead of just being concerned about what's going on in my own world. Holy Spirit, lead us, teach us, train us, raise us up as a band of believers who are highly interested in the needs of people around us. You know, Paul holds up Jesus as an example of this principle of taking interest in the needs of people. But then, if you keep on reading in this same chapter, Philippians chapter 2, what you're going to find is Paul goes on and he gives the example of a young man who had the same kind of hard attitude. I wonder where he got that from. He probably got it from Paul to some degree, but he also got it from Jesus. The young man's name was Timothy. Let's read it. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered, encouraged when I receive news about you. Now listen to what he says about Timothy, verse 20. I have no one else like him of all my co-workers in the gospel. Of all the people that have been doing this journey with me and, and, you know, preaching and teaching and evangelizing and helping in the, in the, in the furtherance of the, you know, the good news. Of all the people that have been serving alongside of me in, in, the, in, the, in this, this mission that God has given to us. Timothy stands above the rest. He says, I have no one else like this young man who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proven himself. Because as a son with his father with me in the ministry, he has has served alongside of me in in, in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I, I, I see how things will go with me. As soon as I can work it out with the the plan and the agenda, I'm going to send Timothy your way so that he can bring back to me a good report about how you guys are doing. But but I just hold this this young man, Timothy, up for you. Wow, I have nobody else like him. He has so proven himself as as a guy who is genuinely interested in, in in the needs and some of the persecutions and some of the problems and and, and, and some of the, you know, the, the roadblocks that we've, we've run up against in trying to promote the, the good news of Jesus. Wow, this, this guy, Timothy, he's so interested in, in helping people. He said, I love him. <laughs> Paul recognized this quality in this young man, Timothy. He was all about encouraging others. And in due time, guess what? Paul appointed Timothy to be the pastor of the church. In Ephesus, which, which was a pretty important role in the overall New Testament scheme of things. Yeah, Paul mentored this young man, Timothy, and Timothy really caught on to the heart of Jesus, having a heart for, for people. And Paul said, Timothy, 
I'm appointing you to be the senior pastor of the church in Ephesus. With the help of the Lord, you can do it. You're young, but the Lord is with you. You've got a heart for this. And so he was elevated. He was, he was given this, this reward, this blessing. Do you, do you see how this principle of the refund, do you see how there's a, a rebound effect? When you care about people, when you take interest in people, when you reach out, and you're not just self-serving, but you're others serving. Do you see how, how this, this refund policy always has a rebound effect? If you help others, you yourself will be benefited. Just ask Timothy. Yeah. How many of you have watched the Christmas movie called Miracle on 34th Street? How many of you have seen that? Come on, raise your hands nice and high if you've seen one of the versions of that movie. There's the old black and white one, you know, and then the one that's been produced more recently, and there's a number of different versions out of Miracle on 34th Street. I, I really like that movie. I'm not a big, you know, Santa Claus guy, but, but I, I really love that movie because, because somewhere at, at the heart of that movie, there's a really, really wise, wise principle that we see portrayed. Of course, it's in the movie, as, as most of you know, there's a very famous New York department store called Macy's, and it's the height of the, the Christmas season. And, and so the store, in, in the storyline of the movie, the store adopts this radical policy of referring their customers to other stores. You know, if the parents are wanting to get something for their kids, but Macy's doesn't happen to have it in stock, they will find out what store in town does have it, and they will refer their customers to their competitors, of all things. <laughs> and so they adopt this, this unheard of policy. And, 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 and again, it's the idea of being genuinely interested in helping their customers. And consequently, as Mr. Macy himself said in the movie, he said, consequently, our profits will be increased as we direct our customers elsewhere. And no doubt they'll be happy with us for doing so, and, and they'll be repeat customers for us. And so the story goes in that movie. And of, of, of course, that's exactly what happened. Macy's benefited from being genuinely interested in the happiness of their customers by sending them elsewhere. And it's, 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 this is a foolproof biblical principle. Why, why, why would it work for Macy's? Why would it work for Timothy? Why would it work for anybody? Because it's in the Bible. Right? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. A generous person will prosper. Listen to this. Whoever refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. Makes sense to me. Yeah, it's the universal law of get. If you give, it'll come back to you. As somebody said, if you want a greater rebound, throw the ball harder. <laughs> Give and you will receive. Jesus said it himself in Luke 6, 38. All right, let's bring this down to where we live. Think about your own personal experience. Listen carefully. Since you made the decision to follow Jesus, has this experience made a noticeable difference in your life? I mean, is it noticeable for you? Maybe the better question is, is it noticeable for others? Would the, the people who know you, they knew you before you became a Christian. They've known you since you became a Christian. The people who know you well, would they claim that there's an unmistakable difference in you since you've been running around with Jesus? And since you've been running around with other people who run around with Jesus? Is there a change that has taken place in your life? Are you a new and improved person? And, and, and of course, there's so many different ways that we are subject to change. 
Now that we have made that all-important decision to align ourselves with Jesus, put our faith in Him, and, and be revolutionized by the power of the gospel, you know, this, this decision, this crucial, vital decision to say, Jesus, from here on out, I am following you, of course. I acknowledge you as my Savior. When we make that decision, wow, there's all kinds of, of ways that, that being a Christian will affect change in your life and mine. But this morning, can we talk about this one way that knowing Jesus can't help but change you and I? It's this. Have you become a less selfish person than you once were? Now, don't get defensive. Stop judging me, pastor. <laughs> That's dangerous territory. Selfishness. No, come on. It's a legitimate question. Can we talk? Are you less selfish now than you once were before, thankfully, somebody introduced you to your Savior, Jesus Christ? Awfully quiet in here. <laughs> Folks, don't get me wrong, okay? I am not suggesting... Well, before we became a Christian, we were all a bunch of selfish brats. And now that we are born again, we are totally delivered from being self-absorbed. And now we totally live to serve others. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. But would you agree with me? Would you be willing to admit that what the Bible teaches about fallen human nature, that nasty sin factor. It's really true. According to the Scripture, we clearly understand that fallen humans, people who have been infected with that fallen sin nature as a result of the original sin of Adam and Eve, it's been passed down to every successive generation of humanity. Because of that sin factor, we tend to be selfish. Now, granted, there's a lot of selflessness. I mean, you get around people, especially this time of year, wow, there's so much in humanity to admire, right? There's so many acts of loving kindness and people being nice to one another and, and people giving sacrificially and, and being really unselfish. There's, there's a lot of unselfishness in humanity. But listen to me. Isn't it true that there also is this, this, this root of selfishness at the core of who we are? We need to be set free from that. Right? That needs to be changed. That needs to be adjusted through the spiritual rebirth that's so available to us in Jesus. Come on, selfish, selfish. Does that word selfish sound at all familiar? Is there anybody in church this morning that would be willing to honestly plead guilty to any attitudes or behavior patterns that are, that are kind of self-centered, self-seeking, self-serving? Am I the only one or is anybody else? You ever, you ever catch yourself being a wee bit selfish in all of your, you know, dealings with others, in all of your just relating to the stuff of life? Selfishness. <laughs> we'll never overcome things until we are honest enough to admit, hey, I have an issue. I need help. <laughs> See, the question is, has it made a difference since you've been under the influence of Jesus? Since you've been under the influence of the Holy Spirit, since you've been under the influence of the Word of God, since you've been under the influence of the, the love of God, since you've been under the influence of Christian people that you rub shoulders with, has it made a difference in who you are and, and how you do life? Are you less selfish than you once were? Because this is one of the, you know, the, the, the objects of, of the game. Less selfishness and more being interested in how can I help others? Is there a discernible difference in you now that you are spiritually reborn, now that you have clearly understood Jesus? You died on that cross to deal with my sin, to deal with my selfishness. 
And so, of course, I ask you to come into my life. Be my Savior. Lord, just go ahead and root out all of that, that selfishness. I want to be like you. I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to have your heart attitude and be interested. It's, life is going to be so much more fun, Lord, if I, I catch on to how this works, that, that it's, it's all about, you know, blessing others, helping others, reaching out and, and being interested in what somebody else is struggling with and being an agent of encouragement to them. Oh, life becomes so sweet when we're thinking about others and not just always thinking about ourselves. You can derive so much pleasure from from being a giver, instead of always being a taker. Somebody say amen. You know, it doesn't just happen overnight, though, right? It's a process. The Apostle Paul, he taught a lot about spiritual maturity, right? As we grow in our spiritual life, it becomes less and less about me, myself, and I, and, and then increasingly, it's about helping others. Everybody say others. Others, others, others. Oh, let's get that stuck in our system. Because even, even today, before this day is over, you're going to have opportunity to, you know, to do something in favor of others instead of insisting on your own way. You know, Christmas is a great illustration of this shift of focus that comes with maturity. You understand how that works? When you're a kid, oh my goodness. When you're a child, Christmas is coming and you're thinking, well, well, what am I going to get? What's in it for me? What's going to be under the tree with my name on it? And, and so as a child, you're, you're thinking in terms of, of self-interest. What will I receive for Christmas? But as the years go by, you know, as the kid grows up and begins to earn some money and get some allowance and have a piggy bank and, and have, a, you know, a growing financial interest of their own. And what do you know? The, the, the kid starts to go to the, to the store and actually buy some small Christmas presents and put the family's names on them and put them under the tree and just feel so special about being not only a receiver of Christmas gifts, but now I'm a big boy now. I'm becoming a giver of Christmas gifts. Yes. And, and then later on, you get a part-time job, and then you get a full-time job, and now you really get into this thing about, you know, blessing others at Christmas time in Jesus' name, and it feels so good. What's going on? It's the process of, of maturity, right? And then, of course, when you become a parent and a grandparent, and now you've got more resources to work with, and Boy, now the maturity thing is, is really deepening and developing. And now you really get a kick out of, of seeing the expression of the kids and, and, and the grandkids when they're opening the gifts that, that you purchased for them because you, you're able to and you want to bless them. And it's just so much more pleasurable to, to give than, than it is to receive. You know, uh, grandpa is, Grandpa's not thinking, oh, I wonder what I'm going to get for Christmas. No, Grandpa's thinking, I can hardly wait to see Junior's face when, when he, you know, opens that card up and, and acknowledges that I've paid for his full year of tuition at college. This is so much fun to give, right? <laughs> Remember what Jesus said, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. That word blessed means happy. It's more fun to give than it is to receive. It's more gratifying and more satisfying to, to be interested in blessing other people than it is to be interested in your own selfish accumulation of stuff. <laughs> It's more fun to give than it is to receive. Come on, anybody in church this morning that feels that way, would you say amen? Come on, Lord, teach us how to do life your style. <laughs> Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, and, and you have learned to derive more pleasure from being on the giving end of gifts than being on the receiving end of gifts, not just at Christmas time, but all year around. I want to conclude today with a sampling of O. Henry. Now, don't get excited. I'm not talking about the chocolate bar, okay? I'm talking about the author. Who's ever heard of the author named O. Henry? That's the initial O, last name Henry. Okay, I see a hand over here. Anybody else? Who's heard of O. Henry? Wow. 
Well, maybe, maybe when I tell you about one of his famous short stories, maybe you'll recognize some of his work. But yeah, O. Henry was the author. Back in 1905, he gave us what has become a very, very endearing short story. It's like a modern day parable. The story is called The Gifts of the Magi. The Gifts of the Magi. It has nothing to do with the three kings. It has everything to do with being a wise man or a wise woman. Yeah. So beautifully, this story illustrates the unselfish quality of thinking about someone else, not just thinking about yourself. Yeah. The Gifts of the Magi. The story is about a young married couple, Jim and Stella. Times were tough. Money was scarce. Christmas was approaching. Stella counted up her, her money. She'd been saving up a penny here, a couple of pennies there. And she had a grand total of $1.87, which would purchase back then a whole lot more than it will right now. But still, it wasn't nearly enough that she'd be able to use it to purchase something really meaningful, something really special, because she... She so wanted to purchase for her dear Jim a really nice Christmas present. And she thought, what can I do with $1.87? But there was something that Stella possessed that was of great value. And so she thought to herself, I'm going to sell it so that I can purchase a gift for my, for my darling. It was her hair. Stella had long, beautiful hair. Her hair was almost to her knees. Now, that was back in an era when you could sell hair and receive money from people who would use the hair for whatever their purposes was. And so she went to a certain shop downtown and indicated that she'd made the decision to have them cut her hair and uh, she would receive the money for it. She received almost $20 for her beautiful long hair. And then she went out and she made a purchase. She thought this through because her husband, Jim, owned a pocket watch that was very valuable to him. It had belonged to his grandfather, and after that it belonged to his dad, and now it belonged to Jim, but he had never had a chain to go with that pocket watch. And she thought, I'm going to give Jim for Christmas a really nice pocket watch chain. It was platinum. She went and picked it out. She made the purchase. It was almost $20. In fact, it was a little bit over $20 for the purchase of that chain, leaving her just a few cents left in her pocket. But oh, she was so happy. She went home. She wrapped up this gift. And it was Christmas Eve. And meanwhile, Jim had been thinking the same thing. What can I get for Stella? We have hardly any financial resources to work with, but I really want to bless my wife. He did, in fact, purchase a gift for Stella. And then he returned home. And when he came home, he was met by his wife, whose hair was short. Her prayer had been, Lord, please let Jim still think I'm pretty, even though my hair is been chopped off. It didn't matter to him. When he saw her haircut, he was looking for an explanation. She produced the gift and said, here, honey, please open it. I know it's not Christmas Day yet, but I can hardly wait for your response. Please open this gift that I bought for you. He opened up the gift, and it was really beautiful, that pocket watch chain. He took his wife in his arms for a long, long embrace. And he spoke words of love to her and she to him. And then he said, sweetheart, I have a gift for you. And he produced the gift and she opened it up. It was a beautiful box. And inside the box was a really nice hairdressing kit. 
you know, with assorted different brushes and other items. And the two of them didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. (laughs) But it was the most special Christmas Eve ever for them. It wasn't that their gifts for each other had backfired. Her hair would grow back, right? And although he would never recover the, 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 the watch that had belonged to his grandfather and then to his father, surely the Lord would provide for him another pocket watch to go with that chain, a watch that would be especially meaningful for him because of the chain. I'll tell you what that evening did produce. It produced in the hearts of, of those, those two uh, spouses that were so deeply in love with each other. It produced in them a deep, deep sense of confirmation that what they were really interested was the happiness of the other person, not just thinking about themselves. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Come on, in 2022... When we get closer to February, as I mentioned, we're going to be introducing this theme of of helping people. Let's be all about helping one another, helping others, helping people that don't know the Lord. Let's let's help the Lord and allow the Lord to help us to, to get the job done that he's called us to do. We're going to be all about helping people this year. Today, I'm just wanting to plant a seed of thought in your spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit. Rise up in every one of us. Come on, folks. Would you stand with me? I say, Holy Spirit, stir up in us that that desire that we would all be agents of, of helpfulness. I want to challenge every one of you on this final Sunday of 2021. Come on, let's, let's, let's be people who increasingly have the mind of Christ, that we have a genuine concern, a genuine interest, a genuine care, genuine reaching out to others kind of, of heart. I guarantee you will have opportunities. There'll be all kinds of opportunities that will come our way. And either those opportunities will pass us by because we were oblivious to those opportunities while we were so concerned about our own interests. Or those opportunities will come our way and we will see it for what it is. And in Jesus' name, we will reach out to show our interest and our care and our helpfulness to people around us in ways small and great. I assure you, those opportunities will come. You ever heard the name William Booth? William and Catherine Booth. Who knows who they are? (laughs) Yeah, many years ago, the founders of the Salvation Army. Don't you know that's a ministry of mercy? They have reached out and helped so many people on the street and elsewhere. Wow, the ministry of Salvation Army. Years ago, the story is told that William and Catherine sent out Christmas greeting cards to all of the Salvation Armor workers. Yeah. All the Salvation Army officers, as they're known as. And in that Christmas greeting card sent out by the booths, there was just one simple word. You know what that word was? Others. Others. He was just trying to convey to all of the Salvation Army workers that, that, they, would, that they would be especially inclined to, to be reaching out to others. That's what it's all about. For those of us who already have been wonderfully changed by the saving grace of God, now it's all about others. Who else can we reach with this amazing love of Jesus Christ? Opportunities will come our way. Will we do what's in the best interests of others? Or will we just insist on having our own way in a given situation? Holy Spirit, help us to keep our own interests in check. Go ahead and still look after your own interests and your own household. That's good. That's important. But oh, let's also have an eye to notice the needs of others. And be gracious to them. In Jesus' name. Come Holy Spirit right now. 
stir up in every one of us such a, a, a valuable, powerful spiritual interest in people around us. Deliver us from selfishness. And so help us, Jesus. We will be interested in others. Amen. Amen. Come on, as we just continue to stand before the Lord, let's just take a few moments right now just to uh, really allow the good news of the gospel to sink in with us. Maybe you received the Lord years ago, but on this, on the, on this Christmas weekend, just in a fresh kind of way, just allow the Holy Spirit to make it so real to you once again. Wow, the, the Son of God came, came among us to, to lay His life down so that we would be heaven-bound, so that we would be spiritually reborn, so that we would receive the blessing of God upon our lives and be freed from the power of sin. Let it become very, very precious and meaningful to you, to, to you again as we celebrate Christmas one more time. But it might be that there's others of you that you didn't make this decision to become a Christian years ago. Maybe you've never made that clear-cut decision to say, Lord, how do I get in on this deal? Count me into the family of God. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. Whether you're here in-house this morning or whether you're watching online, if you know that you need Jesus, it's not too late for you to truly, beautifully celebrate the real meaning of what Christmas is all about. You can receive Jesus as your Savior right here and right now. You can be celebrating Christmas for the rest of your life by placing your faith squarely on the person of Jesus of Nazareth. So I want to invite all of us to pray this prayer together in all sincerity. Come on, church. Whether you're here in person, whether you're watching online, let's all pray this prayer and put our faith in the Saviorship of Jesus Christ. Pray this. Dear Jesus. Come on, everybody. Dear Jesus. You are so dear to me. I love you, Lord. I believe in you. I know that you came to this earth to be the Savior of my soul. You died on that cross. You rose from the grave to give me a brand new start. Forgive me, Lord, for all of my selfishness. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to live with a keen interest in helping others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand, would you? Let's celebrate His saving grace today and every day. We're going to wrap up our service with one more song, but before we do that, may I simply say, Merry Christmas. The blessing of the Lord Jesus be upon every household represented here today. And for those who are watching online, may you receive the grace of God in all of your reaching out to one another. May the joy of the Lord be so a part of your celebration of Christmas. Can you say amen? I receive that. God bless you, Gateway. Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online church service. We pray that you were encouraged by today's worship and message. And hey, maybe you're new to Gateway and you've never been to one of our in-person services. We encourage you to come and spend a Sunday with us at one of our service times, either 9.30 or 11.30. It would be great to meet you and have you here with us. Hey, have a great week and we'll see you again next time.